Thank you for taking the time to view this presentation. My name is Richard Klein. I grew up along White Marsh Run, which is the main tributary to Bird River. Because of this, I share your alarm over the deplorable condition of both waterways. But over the next 20 minutes, you'll learn how to identify potential sources of sediment pollution, eroded soil, within the Bird River watershed. On Saturday, November 22nd, we'll meet again at the Bird River Hall to develop a strategy to get each source corrected. This graph shows the best guess by watershed scientists of the sediment sources plaguing Bird River. In past decades, mining would have been shown as a principal source. Unfortunately, much mining sediment remains in the watershed and may still work its way down into Bird River. Our survey will focus on the current major sources of sediment shown here. The publication on the left sets forth the county's plan to restore Bird River. All in all, it's a pretty good plan, but it fails to address some very severe shortcomings in the enforcement of our clean water laws. The graph on the right shows the results of a recent survey by 22 local, statewide, and national organizations. The survey showed that of the 89% of construction site soils that should be treated with erosion control measures, only 18% actually were treated in Baltimore County. Our survey will be a second step in improving compliance. Through the survey described in this presentation, we'll begin identifying all the significant sources of sediment pollution within the Bird River watershed. We'll then develop a strategy to get each corrected by working with the property owner, developer, the county, and the state. Here you see three examples of what was accomplished from a rather minimal effort. Imagine what we can achieve with dozens or hundreds of Bird River residents supporting county and state efforts to enforce clean water laws and accelerate implementation of the Bird River Restoration Plan. Here you see a map of the Bird River watershed. The grid overlying the watershed is the county's 200 scale mapping system. Each grid covers about nine-tenths of a square mile, or 550 acres. A total of 48 grids overlap the Bird River watershed. We're going to ask you to form a team of two or three people. Then we'll ask each team to survey several of these grids for potential sediment pollution sources. For each grid assigned to your team, you'll receive a map like this showing the roads and waterways within the grid. Note that the grid number is shown at the bottom right. We suggest you drive all the roads within a grid before going on to the next grid. You'll use a separate survey form for each grid. You will also receive an aerial photo covering the same grid area as the street map. Of course, the grid number is shown on the bottom right on both the map and the aerial. Keep checking the street map so you don't wander off into another grid by crossing the solid red line. Again, please use a separate survey form each time you finish one grid and go on to the next. We urge you to drive down all roads that appear public, but avoid those where you encounter a gate or see no trespassing or private property signs. Here you see a number of named roads. Of course, all of these roads should be driven. The road on the right with a question mark looks private, but it's labeled Bird River Road on some maps. Again, don't go down roads like this if they're gated or posted, no trespassing, no trespassing or private property. Keep in mind that some grids overlap into other watersheds. Here you see that the Bird River watershed only occupies the northwest upper left portion of grid 09A1. The dashed line marked by the red arrows separates the Bird River watershed from that of Middle River to the south and the gunpowder to the east. Of course, you should stay within the Bird River watershed. These six photos illustrate what you'll be looking for, which is any area where soil is visible. If you can see soil, then it's susceptible to erosion. Please focus on the following four categories of sediment sources. Construction sites, crop fields, erosion below road crossing pipe outfalls, and other sources. 
The survey forms provide space for 10 sources within each of the four categories. You'll use a separate form for each aerial photo in your packet. It's up to your team who fills out the survey form, makes notation on the aerial photo, takes photos and GPS readings. If your team has the choice, then you should travel in the highest vehicle any team member has. An SUV is better than a sedan. The extra height can make a big difference in what you can see. Team members should seek to agree on the data entered onto the form. Please use a dark blue pen since this shows up best when the forms are photoed or scanned. We'll supply each team with a clipboard, pen, dry erase board, and dry erase pen, survey forms, street maps, and aerial photos. Team members should bring any of these items they have. Please complete the form based on what you can see from roads and other public areas. Please do not trespass. What's a public area? Well, it's any place where people are free to go without permission, like most parking lots, streets, businesses, sidewalks along roads, hike and bike trails, waterways you can paddle, stores, parks, etc. Here you see an example of how to fill out the survey form header. Again, please fill out a separate form for each grid you survey. For the larger sources, draw a boundary line around the area with a blue pen, then put an ID number within the boundary line. Here you see C1 for the first construction site encountered while driving the roads within the area covered by this aerial photo. Of course, the second and third construction sites encountered within the same aerial photo would be labeled C2 and C3. For small sources, just write the ID nearby and draw an area to the specific location. The first photo you take at each site should be of a dry erase board with information like you see here. Each team will get a dry erase board like this one along with dry erase pens and a memory stick. At the start of the survey, write the first three lines, date, last name of team members and the grid number. Leave space at the bottom for ID, project name, and GPS coordinates. If you're careful, you only need to change the last two lines at each subsequent site within the same grid. By making the board the first photo, we'll know where all subsequent photos were taken. At the end of each survey day, copy all your photos onto the memory stick your team received. You'll turn the memory stick in along with completed forms and aerial photos. If you don't have a GPS, then look the coordinates up when you get home using Google Earth or other similar uh, online sources. Now we'll review the process for completing the form with regard to each of the four source categories, beginning with construction sites. Our focus is on the protection of soils from the erosive effects of rainfall and runoff. Protection, or stabilization, is achieved mostly with straw mulch and grass. Stabilization can reduce sediment pollution by 90 to 99 percent, which is far superior to that achieved with other control measures. So the best way to prevent Bird River sediment pollution is to eliminate exposed soil. Construction sites come in a variety of types and sizes. They range from an isolated home to massive shopping centers. Even completed projects may still have areas of exposed, eroding soil like the hillside gully in the upper left. And sites may go inactive, but are still required to achieve a ground cover over a minimum of 95% of the site, and the ground cover must completely blanket the underlying soil from view. Usually there will be a sign at the entrance giving the name of the project. In the lower right you see that this first site has been labeled on the aerial photo and a blue line defines the site boundary. Once the vegetation is cleared from the interior of a construction site, bulldozers, graders, and other earth moving equipment fill and cut to bring the site up to rough grade. This is the point where building, road, and other construction can begin. So once building foundations appear and road or parking lot construction begins, then the site is at rough grade and most exposed soils must be stabilized 
from the erosive effects of rain and runoff. Here we see the various stabilization methods. Foundations are usually self-contained, so there's no need for interior stabilization, but all adjoining areas should be covered with enough straw mulch so underlying soil cannot be seen. Road and parking lot beds should be covered with four inches of stone. All other areas of exposed soil are mulched and seeded. The mulch must be replenished whenever soil can be seen through it. During the growing season, March to October, grass should cover at least 95% of the surface within four to eight weeks of seeding. Reseeding and mulching is needed if coverage is less than 95%. Fertilization and irrigation may be needed too. The photo on the right is what you see on far too many sites. Half or more of the soil is visible through scant grass and mulch. The stone on road and parking lot beds should be replenished if it washes away and soils are exposed. So how do you know if a site is a rough grade? The point at which stabilization must occur. Again, once building foundations appear or road construction begins, then the site is definitely at rough grade. This is how the survey form and the aerial photo should appear after you have completed your survey of the first construction site encountered. Obviously, you will continue driving the roads within the area covered by the aerial photo while keeping an eye out for any of the four types of potential sediment sources. Now for crop fields. The table in the upper right gives an indication of the dramatic reduction in crop field pollution attainable with just two best management practices, or BMPs. With conventional tillage, little plant residue, that is leaves, stalks, etc., protects the soil surface from erosive forces, as shown in the left upper photo. With conservation, or low-till tillage, substantial residue protects the soil, as in the lower left photo. Winter cover crops are effective practices but may be difficult to apply to some crops. The presence of rills or gullies may indicate the need for a grassed waterway. This photo was taken a week ago and shows how a winter cover crop would appear now. You should see low grass-like plants sprout, sprouting throughout the crop field. Winter cover crops like barley or wheat should have been planted in early October. Again, if they are present, you should see green grass-like plants growing throughout a crop field. Unfortunately, cover crops are most practical when planted in harvested corn fields, so most other fields may lack cover crops. As with construction, draw a boundary around each crop field and add an ID like F1, F2, etc. Now we turn to pipe outfalls. Watershed scientists believe that a large part of the sediment from a developed watershed like Bird River comes from erosion beginning at the end of pipes and extending downstream for a mile or so. These would be pipes carrying streams underneath roads or those discharging stormwater from developed areas. During the survey, we'd like you to focus on road crossings. Your aerial photos and street maps will show where roads cross larger streams, which are usually shown as blue lines. Stop at these crossings and at pipes carrying smaller waterways too. Take a look downstream of the crossing for the erosion indicators pictured here. If the channel is stable and not a significant sediment source, then the bank should be fully covered with vegetation. But if you see bare soil or exposed roots on the banks, then this indicates active erosion. Also, when pipes are installed, the pipe bottom should be flush with the stream bed. Elevated pipes may indicate erosion of the channel bed. In the upper right photo, the pipe bottom is flush with the bed, but not so in the lower right photos. Of course, you should assign each crossing a unique ID number and take a photo of any erosion indicators or of a well-vegetated channel. Rather than noting the location of the pipe outfall on the aerial photos, use the street map. It'll be far easier to see the outfall locations on the street maps. 
write the ID number nearby and draw an error to the actual location. As the name implies, other sources are any other area you come across where you see exposed soil. Here are three of the many possible examples. We hope to educate all 60,000 Bird River Watershed residents that exposed soil equals pollution. In other words, they should think that a nearby waterway will be polluted come the next major storm whenever they see exposed soil. As more and more watershed residents appreciate ES equals P, then voluntary correction of sediment sources will become increasingly easier. Finally, use the comment section at the end of the form to note anything you feel is relevant but wasn't covered in the four sections of the form. So, after the surveys are completed, we'll have a long list of sediment pollution sources. What will we do with them? Well, here you see an outline of the actions we'll take with regard to construction sites and crop fields. It's vitally important that we exhaust efforts to work cooperatively with those responsible for areas of exposed soil. Also, we need to resist the temptation to criticize inspectors if enforcement seems ineffective. Instead, we should focus on expanding public support for truly effective enforcement. Erosion of pipe outfalls requires a somewhat different approach. With this source, we're not really dealing with an enforcement issue. Instead, our challenge will be to provide county and state agencies with the public support needed to solve the erosion problem, which may require pipe replacement, channel stabilization, or both. The approach with other sources will depend upon whether it's farm-related, a mining relic, etc. At 10 a.m. on Saturday, November 22nd, we'll meet again at the Bird River Community Hall. We hope at least one member of each team can attend. We'll ask each team to present their findings. After the presentations are complete, we'll form a strategy for getting all of the sediment sources corrected. If no member of your team can make the meeting, then please get your information to Buzz and Sandy. In the meantime, thank you for helping to make Bird River a healthier, safer waterway for all of us.